Well, meanwhile, I tell you the clinical case that I had prepared. It's a classical clinical case, a patient that come to the emergency room for um, uh, a pain at the chest, obviously has signs of ischemia, undergoes uh, an angiogram via right femoral artery, has a percutaneous intervention. Uh, after two days for a pain at the leg, uh, he's given uh, an SAID, and then uh, he has a mild rise of creatinine with uh, then uh, later a recovery upon also hydration. He is discharged, but after two years, he has a CKD. So this is an extremely common example of what happens to many of our patients. And uh, the current concept that is behind the clinical behavior of our patients is that acute kidney injury is a potentially reversible disease. Although we know very well that then on the long term, this may not be true. There is a concept behind this that is related to the mechanism of recovery, that is that the tub, the tubule, has a high regenerative potential. And so after an episode of acute kidney injury, it can undergo the differentiation, proliferation, and replacement of all the lost tubular cells. So this happens because the survived tubular cells, the differentiate and divide. That's why then we observe function recovery due to replacement of lost tubular cells. And then, in this view, the idea that a CKD develops after an acute kidney injury episode in a patient uh, is related to the fact that there can be a maladaptive repair process. And so that to avoid CKD after ACI, we must somehow, in addition to uh, arrive early to treat our patients, to reduce fibrosis. But which is the evidence of all this statement? Okay, that acute kidney injury is a potentially reversible disease, at least in terms of kidney function, is obviously something that we see every day in our unit. But that the tubule has a high regenerative potential is an idea that comes mostly from immunostaining for cell cycle markers. And that survived tubular cells, they differentiate and divide, comes from immunostaining for mesenchymal markers and for tracing recently performed of tubular cell markers in mouse model of acute kidney injury. The idea that uh, CKD after ACI comes from maladaptive repair comes from the popular view of regeneration to explain the association among acute kidney injury and CKD that we observe in certain patients. If the tubule has a high regenerative potential, in some patients, the things goes wrong. And the idea that uh, to avoid CKD after ACI, we must reduce fibrosis comes from the association among fibrosis and CKD and not to the effective uh, existence of any uh, demonstration as shown by the many clinical trials that reducing fibrosis really can treat our patients. So we know very well that even mild up acute kidney injury episodes can induce an increase of risk of developing CKD, even if the patient has apparently recovered. So what really happens after acute kidney injury? Okay, to try to give an answer to this question, we try to use an unbiased approach. Uh, in my lab, we have worked for many years on the idea that not all the tubular epithelial cells may have the same capacity to divide to injury, but there may be a subset of tubular epithelial cells that we call progenitors that may have a capacity to respond to injury differently from all other tubular epithelial cells. So these are the two then most common view of how tubular regeneration is going on after acute kidney injury. This is a classical idea. When you have injury, you have loss of tubular epithelial cells and they survive tubular epithelial cells, they differentiate and divide to replace the lost tubular cells. This is the idea that we have explored that there may be some tubular cells that have an enhanced capacity to regenerate in comparison to the other, and that after an acute kidney injury, they simply divide to replace the lost tubular cells. So to address which of the two hypotheses may be true, we have taken two models, um, two models of lineage tracing in two different mice, transgenic mice, 
In one of these mice, we have traced in an unbiased manner all the tubular epithelial cells, and in the other, we have traced only the tubular progenitors. Both these models are based on the fact that um, if the cell expresses the marker, there is no possibility that after acute kidney injury, whatever other tubular cells will express that marker de novo. So all the tubular cells that we observed can only be a progeny if they bring the label of the cells that were present at the beginning. So this is something that is much more reliable than immunostaining because it excludes the possibility that the cell that participate to injury acquire phenotype that they didn't have at the beginning. We have used two models of acute kidney injury, an ischemia model and a nephrotoxic acute kidney injury, injury model. For the ischemia model, we use unilateral ischemia and uh, we induced 30 minutes of unilateral ischemia in these mice, and we measured GFR over time, and we observed a drop of GFR after 24 hours that was followed by a recovery, although with uh, uh, a slight reduction of GFR that remained at the end of the observation period 30 days later, a similar outcome we observed in the nephrotoxic acute kidney injury model where we injected glycerol inducing a rhabdomyolysis and then hemoglobinuria, myoglobinuria, and uh, uh, acute kidney injury. So in both the models, we anyway observed recovery of function. But then we um, used, we applied the model to our transgenic system. What happens in this model? That all the tubular epithelial cells can be labeled by a fluorochrome. This model allows the expression of four different colors, red, blue, yellow, and green. And this happens in a random manner in all tubular epithelial cells, so that if you take a healthy kidney at time zero, this is what you observe in the healthy kidney. But if then you induce an acute kidney injury in these mice and you observed what happens 30 days later, you see that there is the appearance of some small clones, and that what is more interesting even is that these uh, colored cells are uh, more scars all over the tissue. So we have counted the number of labeled cells, and we have observed that after 30 days, there is a considerable depletion of the number of labeled cells. This cannot depend by the unregulation of the fluorochrome <laughs> because this is a closed system. Huh? When you, uh, uh, the labeling is induced through administration of an antibiotic. When you remove the antibiotic, this labeling cannot in any manner be induced or downregulated in other cells. So this can only be related to disappearance of some of the cells. And the same we observed in the nephrotoxic acute kidney injury model. So what this model tells us is that after acute kidney injury, even if you have a functional recovery, this always masks persistent loss of tubular epithelial cells. Now, we have diluted the administration of the antibiotic that we give to the mice to induce the upregulation of the color to count the clones that we had obtained after acute kidney injury. So we see a persistent depletion of the tubular epithelial cells, but was there regeneration? With this model, we can see which new cells were generated after acute kidney injury. And what we can see is that indeed there is a division after acute kidney injury. There is a persistent depletion, but the depletion would be even worse if there would not be some regeneration. So there are new cells generated, but this replaces only around a half of the cells that were primarily lost. And this is true in both the models. And what is even more interesting is that apparently the progeny of these cells is the progeny of only a small amount of tubular cells. So we see around 8% of the cells that divided in the ischemia model and around 3.5% of the cells that divided in the rhabdomyolysis model. <laughs> so this is what happens if we trace all the tubular epithelial cells. <laughs> 
Now let's see what we can see if we trace only the cells that we consider are tubular progenitors. Okay, this is the model that we have described over years and also other groups in human. The distribution of this uh, progenitor in uh, human is in the Bowman capsule, and these cells are deputed mostly to replace podocyte, and then at the urinary pole and scattered along the tubule, and these cells have the potential to replace tubular cells. The scattered cells along the tubule are localized in specific segments, so mostly some in the S2 segments, mo most of them in the S3 segment, and some in the thick ascending limb and convoluted distal tubule. Now we have a model, I told you, where we can selectively trace this progenitor population. We have already published it uh, and shown that this can mediate the replacement of podocytes uh, after injury into uh, mice, but we see also in this model several scattered tubular cells localized in specific areas, and uh, this model is based on, the, on a, a marker that is uh, the transcription factor PAX2. Okay, the distribution that we see in the mouse, also in the tubule, is very similar to the one that we had hypothesized for renal progenitor in the uh, tubule, in human. And we have now studied what happens to these progenitors in models of acute kidney injury. So the results are completely different from the one that we have observed when we trace all the tubular epithelial cells. Here we see generation of clones. So where you have a series of cells all of the same color, it seems that there was div it means that there was division and that one cell of that color generated the progeny all identical. And if we count the number of the cells and the clones, we see that these cells in opposite manner to all other tubular epithelial cells, they expand. So here you see the comparison with all the other tubular epithelial cells, and you can see that these cells are more resistant to injury if compared with to Pax8 cells. They are much more clonogenic, and the result is that they increase in number after injury while all other tubular epithelial cells decrease. It's interesting that the majority of these clones are localized in a specific areas, and these are mostly in the S3 segment and in the thick ascending limb, and not in the S1 and S2 segment. There, there are few clones. And what is, was totally unexpected is that when we were analyzing this kind of clones generated after acute kidney injury on a 2D base on the section, we were seeing clones that were small in number, no more than eight, 10 cells, as it commonly considered. Tubular cell undergo few cell division. But think that the tubule is a 3D structure, and that if you really want to know what happens, you need to look at it on a 3D base, and look what happens if you look at it on a 3D base. So this is an entire segment of the tubule, all of a single color yellow, means that all this is the progeny of a unique cell. And so that these progenitors can generate extremely long clones that generate long, regenerate long tubule segments. We observed clones up to 100 cells made by a single cell. Then we made another thing. We, it's well described that there are some drugs that you can give to, tubule, to mice that enhance tubular regeneration after injury. For example, histone diacetylase inhibitors. It's known that they increase uh, tubular proliferation. On which cells do they act? We gave them to the mice. We saw the, increase, the improvement of GFR upon administration. We saw the improvement of uh, tissue structure and the increase of tubular proliferation and regeneration. But when we did the experiment in the uh, mice where the progenitors are labeled, we saw that these drugs act selectively, inducing the proliferation of these progenitors and not of other tubular epithelial cells. Okay, so now we come at the most difficult question that we had when we saw this data. We see, apparently, only a subset of tubular cells that is able to divide upon injury. All the other aren't. But if this is true, 
what do cell cycle markers see? Because if you make cell cycle labeling, for example, with K67 or PCNA or BRDU, whatever cell cycle marker that is normally used also in the clinics to see proliferating cells, you will see that on day two, 40%, 50% of tubular epithelial cells are apparently labeled. And so we think they entered cell cycle and they proliferate. The dogma comes from this. But what do these cells really see? Do they really label proliferating tubular epithelial cells? Okay, my response is not they don't. So to prove this, we have taken an extremely sophisticated model. It's still a transgenic mouse model where the, under the control of the same promoter, so both uh, PAX2 and PAX8 that label the progenitor and all the tubular epithelial cells, we can label the cell that enter the cell cycle in red if they are in G1 and in green if they are in G2M, so they are dividing. And then we have tried to match the results of this mouse with different cell cycle levels. And if we use this mouse, we see few cells that proliferate after acute kidney injury. If we match it with different cell cycle markers, including, for example, phosphorylated histone H3, not only K67 and PCNA, we see that these cell cycle levels level also cells that don't divide. Or in the case of phosphorylated histone H3, they even label cells in G1. So basically, they don't reflect true proliferation. Then what do they see? Okay, I didn't know of the existence uh, of this uh, up to when I had to try to find a response to this problem. We normally know that the cell cycle is of a cell undergoes from G1 to S to G2M to generate two cells. But there are many cycles that are called endocycle that are aberrant cell cycle where the cell goes from G1 to S and then return to G1 without ever passing from mitosis. This means that if a, if a cell undergo this kind of cycle, we'll generate cells that have a double DNA content, but will never generate a progeny. And what for? This is an extremely important mechanism that is needed to undergo hypertrophy. A cell in this manner double its function, but doesn't generate two daughter cells. Okay, so it's important when you need to increase the function of the cell quickly without uh, eventually generating a progeny. So the only way to see if this was the case was to measure the DNA content of these cells and at the same time analyze the cell cycle phase of the cell. And here you can see that while the progenitors are largely green because they truly undergo mitosis, the other tubular epithelial cells don't undergo mitosis, they endocycle. Means they double their DNA, but they never generate a progeny. So this is hypertrophy. In this manner, you can generate a cell that has a double DNA content, while the tubular progenitors can really generate daughter cells undergoing mitosis. And what is interesting is that these two phenomena are quite distributed in the nephron because the mitosis is mostly in the S3 segment and the endocycle is mostly localized in the S2 segment. And this is very uh, intuitive if you think about it because the cells of the S2 segment are an extremely highly specialized post-mitotic cell type. So for them, undergoing division must be much more difficult than for the S3 segment cells, and in addition, the S3 segment cells are extremely simple. So this is the new kind of pathophysiology of response to acute kidney injury that we propose, that after an acute kidney injury episode, you have two types of response. Endocycle means hypertrophy and cell division, and that obviously both the response contribute to induce the recovery of the kidney function. If a cell functions double than before, will make you recover your creatinine quickly. But this doesn't mean that you have new tissue. So the result is anyway a persistent loss of tubular cells. And this would also mean that if you had a loss of many tubular epithelial cells, you need to have many cells that undergo endocycle and work more. So then we took from our biopsy database 10 cases, 
uh, of uh, uh, patients that had a diagnosis of a known cause of CKD and that had had a previous episode or more than one previous episode of acute kidney injury, thinking these are the patients where if this endocycle exists also in human, we should find it. And that's how it is. We, uh, to put it in evidence, we did a co-labeling of phosphorylated histone H3 with a G1 marker, CDK4, exactly like we had observed in the mice. And here you can see cells that, that have uh, the border positive for CDK4 that is typical of G1 cells, but still are red because they express phosphorylated histone H3, so they are endocycling. And in the same biopsy, we also applied FISH for Y chromosome, and we saw many cells that have two Y chromosome, means they have double DNA content. Okay, so in conclusion, I think that we can say that Aki is not a potent, I mean, is an irreversible disease because it tends in tubular epithelial cell loss even when you have recovery of kidney function. The tubule doesn't have a high regenerative potential. Only a small subset of tubular cells divide. Function recovery is mostly due to endocycle-related hypertrophy. CKD after Aki results from persistent massive tubular cell loss. And to avoid CKD after Aki, we must increase regeneration through tubular progenitor division. So these are the people that uh, participated to the work and that did most of the work, mostly Elena Lazzari and Maria Lucia Angelotti and Laura Lasagni. And let me thank all the, also the two ERC grant, the funders that helped me remain funded even with challenging some nephrology dogmas. And thank also to the collaborators, and I thank you for your attention.